This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. President and CEO of Baptist Healthcare, Mark Faulkner, on this edition of Conversations. Mark Faulkner began his health care career over a quarter of a century ago as an administrative resident. He would go on to rise through the ranks of Baptist health care, serving as administrator at Jay Hospital, president of Baptist Hospital, and senior vice president and chief operating officer of Baptist health care, before ultimately becoming president and CEO. Now Faulkner is about to tackle what may be his biggest challenge yet building a new state-of-the-art hospital in Pensacola. The initial footprint is expected to encompass 650,000 square feet and cost over a half a billion dollars. We welcome Mark Faulkner to Conversations. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jeff. Tell me what got you in the healthcare industry? Well, wow, it's a great question. Um, I was an undergrad and I uh, was entering my junior year and I was in the business school. I actually worked for the dean of the business school to help put myself through college. And he wandered in one day and he said, hey, Mark, have you declared a major yet? And I said, well, dean, still working on that. <laughs> so I was challenged to right. think, all right, what, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? Right. Uh, I love the business school, right. but I was really searching for something with meaning in right. life. So I actually wrote my mom and dad a letter, <laughs> and then I set out and I talked to a lot of people in various fields, in accounting and finance and law and other fields. Right, right. But I had an opportunity to come while I was home, mm -hmm. and I spoke to some of the leadership at Baptist Hospital at the time. Okay. And I learned about their day, right. and I learned about the organization and their purpose. Mm -hmm. And I left there thinking, that's what I want to do. Be in healthcare. Yeah, be in healthcare. Uh, be in a business field, that has a significant and meaningful impact on people. So right. that's what led me into this path as an undergrad and then on to University of Alabama, Birmingham for my master's in this field. I think it's kind of neat because you're local and, and you've risen to, to run Baptist, which I, if I'm not mistaken is what, the second largest employer around Northwest Florida? Is That's that, correct, that yes, 7,300 employees. Yeah. So that has to be a pretty neat, uh, neat thing for you to be a local guy being able to, to do that and rise up. It really is. I, I'm, so blessed yeah. uh, to be a local guy. I grew up in Milton. Yeah. Um, uh, my oldest brother still lives in town. My middle brother lives not too far from here. Yeah. And my parents still live in town. Yeah. And I'm blessed because I am in a field that I love, right. yeah. that has meaning and purpose, and every day is challenging, and every day is different. Right. Right. And I'm doing it in an organization that is mission-driven, right. owned by the community. Right. And I'm doing it in a community that I grew up in. Right. That's very rare and unique in this field. It is. Uh, where uh, leadership have the opportunity, as I've had, to right. sort of stay home and still have a meaningful uh, career. Yeah. And, and the neat thing about it is you're seeing the area evolve so much. I mean, and just grow so much. I mean, it's just tremendous. I mean, I think back over, you know, the last 10 or 15 years, but never mind what's happened over the past 25 years. Phenomenal, right? It really is. It's amazing how our entire region has grown and changed. Mm -hmm. And I, it actually takes me back to the beginnings of Baptist Hospital when it was actually built in 1951. Right. It grew out of the very same reason. Back then there were members of the community who got together in the late 30s and early 40s and said, we need a new state-of-the-art hospital. Right. And uh, because the needs at the time of the community were growing right. and evolving. Right. And so of that vision, Baptist Hospital was born and it's grown into Baptist Healthcare. And now as I look back, what's transpired over those last 68 years since we opened in 1951, how the community has continued to evolve and to grow, especially as you say in the last 10 or 15 years when you look at the impact of major employers that have relocated to the community. We look at the development of downtown, the continued prosperity of the beach, uh, the development and growth of University of West Florida and others. It is such a wonderful time to be in this community. Yeah, it truly is. At what point, Mark, did you kind of make the decision or you and your board and, and, and executives make the decision we probably need to move into a, into a new hospital. We need to get a new state-of-the-art hospital because it's a big undertaking. It really is. I would say, with the exception of the original construction, this is the biggest 
undertaking the organization has ever ventured into. So w there was actually um, a task force of our board of directors who we engaged to look at the next 75 years mm -hmm. of uh, this organization. And uh, we actually engaged a master facility planner. Um, I have thought over my years at Baptist, I must have driven to this main campus over 6,000 times. Mm -hmm. And originally we went into this thinking, how can we renovate, how can we expand and refresh the main campus? And so these master planners took a look at our facility. They took a look at our land and our footprint. And after significant time and investment in that analysis, they came back and they said, you know what, it's not doable. There's no way to expand and renovate because the core of that campus, although it served us very well and will continue to serve us until we move, the core does not meet contemporary standards. And so you would be spending hundreds of millions of dollars and still be left with a challenging facility for the next 75 years. Okay, well, that was plan A. Let's right. talk about plan B. Can we build a replacement campus at the same location mm -hmm. on the land that we currently reside on? And they took a look at that. And they came back to the conclusion that you really can't. Uh, we don't have the land footprint. It's like changing your tire while you drive. You just can't do that um, and build on the same location, which took us to plan C. And that is a realization that this is going to involve a, a relocation. So this transpired over the last two or three years. Uh, that's led us to the decision we, we arrived at recently. How will the new hospital be different than the current one other than the obvious? So when the hospital was built originally, uh, gallbladder surgery would stay a week. A mom delivering a baby would stay a week. Uh, it was before we even identified the polio vaccine, for example. Mm -hmm. Healthcare has changed dramatically. And the infrastructure that needs to support that, whether it's room size and hallway capacity to technology support, um, just the bones of the building today versus what we'll be building will be significantly different. Now, capacity in terms of bed size and the like, that'll all be very similar. Okay. Services we'll offer will be very similar, but this will put us in a, in a place that we can really truly meet the needs today and going forward. Yeah. And would you visualize that this expands outside of just, I mean, in other words, you'll draw people in from, from say, South Alabama and various places other than just right in the immediate Northwest Florida area? Yes, we do. We, um, you know, when we looked at the location, that question came up. How can we remain close to our current community that we serve while becoming more accessible to a broader community. Mm -hmm. Because even today, we're a regional provider. Mm -hmm. Folks do travel from Baldwin County, and Escambia County, and Okaloosa, and Walton, and Florida, and other parts. They come to our region for health care. And so as we looked at where should we be relocating to, uh, those questions came up. And we felt like being on one of the main traffic thoroughfares would make ourselves, again, still available and accessible to our local community as well as more accessible to a to a broader community. And of course you're talking about because you're going to be off of I-110 southbound if you're right. That's right. We'll be at the southwest corner there of Interstate 110 and Brent Lane. Okay. And we actually when we came to the conclusion that we were going to need to find a new site it would involve a relocation. We looked at a lot of different options and we actually engaged a third party to help us understand where are the demographics moving? Mm -hmm. Where's the growth happening? What are the traffic patterns? What makes the most sense? And after some um, review, they came back and they said, you know, here are some options, but we actually think the best economic decision would be somewhere in the northern part of the community, up in Pine Forest, that area up there where the growth is happening. <clears throat> and we said, yeah, thanks, that makes a lot of sense, but this is not an economic decision. This is a community decision. Mm -hmm. And so we set out to find an alternative site that would meet the criteria we felt were important, and that is really about community. So we looked at t sites downtown. We looked up the I-110 corridor. The problem was nothing was really for sale. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so over the course of um, a little over a year, yeah. we cobbled together about 55 acres, okay. 33 different parcels, 
and we did it sort of quietly right um, and did it through di different means to maintain confidentiality as you right. might imagine sure, sure. Um, and we were able to put it all together um, in a way that made sense and could accommodate the needs now rumors were it was a Costco Nice. Right. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint the community. It's not a Costco, but it's bad. <laughs> it's, oh, goodness. You know, um, w talk a little bit more about the technology, because it's just so amazing what is happening just in technology in general. And some of the things that I read and hear about in medical technology, what most excites you personally as a CEO about what's happening in medical technology? Well, we're always advancing clinical technology. As you might imagine, when I started 25 years ago, uh, versus what we're doing today is significantly different. And that, again, is what is so exciting about this field. Mm -hmm. Always advancing, always being on the cutting edge. And I, and I will say Pensacola is blessed. We have three wonderful healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. And you can get incredible healthcare here with the latest cutting edge technology. And so when, when I look at the needs of our organization and we look at the needs going forward, technology is always changing. Whether it's the ability to to diagnose. In fact, just yesterday I went to a ribbon cutting for a, our brand new MRI machine because um, we need to continue to make those investments so that we can diagnose incidents and illness uh, as well as treatment. When you think of what the advances in heart, cardiac care and orthopedic care and uh, oncology, mm -hmm. technology has been a huge, huge uh, enabler for us to uh, find new ways and new discoveries of helping healing. You know, there's a lot of talk people talk about right now, and particularly in the political scene, about the cost of health care. Yes. Are you seeing any advancements of the cost of health care to me, the consumer, coming down? Great question, and the answer is absolutely. In the past, health care really was focused on access and focused on quality. And a consumer can relate to access, right? You know, what are the hours of operation? Where's my doctor's office location? Where's the hospital? Where's the emergency department? How can I get access to care? And then quality, it was kind of hard to define. Right. Uh, well, the industry sort of had defined that in the past. What, what are quality outcomes? And what are quality experiences? And how can um, we meet the needs, the changing needs of the consumer? And then last, um, of course, is, is just understanding how we can affect cost. Uh, because in, in the past, costs were less relevant ultimately to the end user, meaning the patient. Right, right. When you had third parties paying the bill, right. Medicare, Medicaid, commercial insurance, right. and the like. <clears throat> well, now, with the proliferation of high deductibles and co-payments and other things, people are price sensitive, mm -hmm. and we're mindful of that. Not even to mention that healthcare as an industry is now approaching 20% of the gross national product as a country. Mm -hmm. That's not sustainable. Right. We've got to figure out ways to bend the cost curve. And we bend that through utilization, and we bend that through access points and other ways, because I think we need to be much more mindful going forward of how we can decrease the overall cost burden of healthcare in our country and in our community. And I'm sure technology is probably driving some of those costs down as well. I mean, you were talking about, you know, you used to have a surgery and you'd be in the hospital for a week and now you're out in a couple of days, right? It is. Yeah. Um, being able to treat patients in a less costly environment with what was done in inpatient care in the past is now often outpatient. Mm -hmm. um, and also going upstream from that, when you look at new entrants into healthcare, others like Google and Amazon and, and Walmart even, uh, disruptors helping to drive down the cost pressures. Uh, technology can also drive up costs. It's expensive. Some of the um, technology that we need to purchase and maintain um, to deliver world-class care. So we're looking at ways to drive down costs. The interesting thing about healthcare is the 2080 rule. Uh, it, in fact, it's actually the 550 rule. 20% of any population generally drives about 80% of the costs, the expenditures. Okay. About 5% drive half of that. So for us to really get at driving down costs um, involves much more of an outward, more proactive, preventative approach to those that are high utilizers, especially when you think of the baby boomers mm -hmm. who are aging into the Medicare 
mm -hmm. uh, now realm and, and, and seeing their utilization and their expenditures go up. So how can we identify the 20%? How can we identify the 5% that often have multiple chronic conditions? Diabetes, congestive heart failure, obesity, uh, cancer, and the like. Uh, and, and help be much more um, acting as a partner with those patients to help with their ultimately with their outcomes and the costs associated with that. For us, that's, that's what we call population health management. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a significant move in that space as a country. How can healthcare providers who are sort of set up and paid to be sick care providers, uh, we generally have been involved in care only when the illness is taking place or the injury has occurred. But yet when you think of the overall outcomes and longevity and quality of life of a person, about 10% of that is affected by what we do inside the four walls of a hospital, of a physician's office. 90% of those outcomes are driven by other factors. 30% is genomics, that's your genetic code, right? right? right. Uh, what you're predisposed to have. Right. Right. But 60% are what we call social determinants of care. It's behaviors, it's environment. It's, um, it's true that you're actually, the outcomes are more driven by your zip code than your genetic code. And so as a healthcare provider, especially a community owned, community based healthcare provider, we're much more interested not only in being really good in the 10%, but also be more impactful in the outside, the social determinants that impact quality of life in our community. That's interesting. I'd never heard that about being driven more by your zip code than your genetic code, but I guess it makes a lot of difference, or makes makes a difference for sure. I mean, so, so essentially what you're saying is perhaps if you are growing up in an area of poverty and maybe you're not getting good food, et cetera, then that, that really stacks the odds against you. It really does. When you look at the zip codes and even census track in our community of Pensacola, it is dramatic, the disparity of outcomes that exist. And when you look at what are the drivers of that, poverty, education, and the environmental factors, food deserts, all the things that contribute to the social determinants which drive the outcomes. How do we fix it? Involvement. I think it's about engagement. I think it's about understanding the challenges. There are great case studies in our, in our country that communities not different than us that have figured out ways to be more impactful uh, to those social determinants. So when, when at Baptist, a community-based organization, we spend a lot of time talking about health outcomes and quality and, and, and all the things that drive what we do, but we spend a lot of time talking about educational outcomes, mm -hmm. talking about poverty. When you look at Escambia County, for example, and you look at our statewide rankings, how does Escambia County compare to the rest of the state in health outcomes? We're generally in the lower third. If you look at educational outcomes, we're generally in the lower third. If you look at prosperity and economic indicators, it's the same story. Basically, it's the same outcome. It's the same slide, just change the heading. These factors are related. And for Baptists to move the needle in health outcomes, we also have to be focused in education. We also have to be focused in poverty. We're understanding that they're all linked together. Mm -hmm. And so is the educational community. I serve with the Achieve Escambia Leadership Council. We talk a lot about health and poverty. I serve on various economic development, community development agencies in the community. We talk about health and education. They're all linked. And so I think for our organization to really be more impactful going forward is understanding what all these factors and how can we have a direct impact. When you look at the bullseye and the center of the bullseye, it's often those census tracts, it's often those zip codes, and it's multifactorial that we as an organization can impact. Do you feel like there's one or two things you're doing right now that is beginning to move the needle? Mm -hmm. Yes, we're partnering uh, with, for example, Community Health of Northwest Florida, it used to be Escambia Community Clinics, mm -hmm. Sacred Heart, and we're understanding who the 5% are, mm -hmm. and how can we um, be more proactive in engaging these patients, these people in the community into a medical home where they are wrapped around in services that can help keep them healthy, 
Um, and that's a, 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 we're seeing immediate results in utilization and costs and outcomes. That's, a, that's an example. Another way, just as an organization, understanding the link between physical health and mental health. It's exciting to hear there's such a growing national conversation about mental health. Yes. And often the, the factors that drive mental health will also drive a, a physical health outcome and vice versa. Right. And we as an organization uh, with Lakeview Center and with the hospitals and the clinics, all that are part of our umbrella, are better linking those services together so that we can improve those outcomes. And it's my understanding too that um, science and medicine is starting to link, um, like for example, poor diet and smoking and various other things to issues with mental health, absolutely. dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera. It, it absolutely, it's, it, one contributes to the other and vice versa. We're also, it's fascinating research. We recently hosted um, a trauma-informed community event down at the Sigma Center, about a thousand people were in attendance. And these were people from the judiciary, from law enforcement, from education, from the business community, elected officials. There's a, there's a concept called trauma-informed community. The most significant correlation between health outcomes, even substance abuse, educational outcomes and the like, are what happened to you as a child. Yeah, really? It's a fascinating study called ACEs. I would encourage you to, to learn more about that. Um, if you have experienced <clears throat> certain events as a child, then those factors build up inside and, you, and you, your, your response to trauma becomes different, it becomes chronic and, con, and it contributes to a negative health outcome and it creates a spiraling effect. So we're interested in building resilience in kids, understanding what causes trauma and how do we as a society change our policies to lighten those traumatic effects on kids and ultimately how they affect a society. It is fascinating. Yeah, it really did, is. Not, did not know that. Um, are you finding that patients are now starting to become more receptive? I always, my sister's in the medical field, and I always hear her say, "Well, somebody is there non-compliant. In other words, they're they're a diabetic, perhaps, and maybe they don't follow a diet or whatever. And I'll just take a pill for it or whatever." Are you are patients starting to change more? I believe so. We, as a as a provider community, need to understand a term called medical literacy. We often talk in terms and vernacular that are hard to relate to. And we want to better engage the patient, better engage their social structure, their family, their spouse, um, to how their uh, behaviors or compliance, as you say, contribute to an improvement in healthcare. Um, we might have in, in the past sort of had the mindset, well, I'll eat what I want, I'll drink what I want, I'll, I'll exhibit these risky behaviors because the hospital down the road will fix it. Fix it right. And to some extent, that's, that's why we're here. Right, right. But also understand what are those factors that had contributed to that and how do we um, meet the patient where they are. Right. I think that's what's really happening when you think of consumerism, mm -hmm. price we talked about, mm -hmm. technology, right. understanding uh, the information that's available. Um, and also, again, engaging the patients. We all have our smart devices, which have all kinds of capabilities, including helping us right. track our health behaviors. Absolutely, absolutely. I've got probably about four minutes left here. Tell me about exciting opportunities for young people in the, in the, in the field of medicine and healthcare. Mm, wow, workforce is a constant opportunity that we as an industry and as an organization face in our community. Um, there seems to be uh, an endless uh, slate of oh, job opportunities, whether it's nursing and technology and, and, and patient care directly, mm -hmm. uh, to informatics and technology on this end of the extreme, um, administration and leadership. Uh, there, there's a never ending, I think, demand for top talent. Um, and my daughter is in nursing school. She right. finishes in May, and I'm so thrilled that she's going into this field mm -hmm. because I know it's a promising field in terms of viability, right. but also a meaningful, meaningful career in terms of impact. Yeah. Is there any particular area that you would encourage a young person to focus in on? I mean, I, I, always nursing, mm -hmm. um, other clinical um, um, roles like physical therapy, pharmacy, radi uh, radiology, uh, ultrasound, lab, they're all uh, just continuing to grow as we see uh, a growing demand for services. And then I would also say uh, from a leadership standpoint, um, 
uh, physician practices uh, as well they continue in, to integrate into hospital systems um, and leadership in that realm and the administration of medicine. You know, I, I wish it weren't as complex as it is, right. but it's complicated uh, as well. So I think there's all types of paths that can lead you into this field. So if you're like me and you don't like the idea of maybe I got to stick a needle in somebody, maybe yeah. think a little yeah. bit more about, yeah. <laughs> about kind of what you're doing, right, yeah. along those lines. I'm that guy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can watch needles except in the ones going into my yeah. arm. <laughs> anyway. But, uh, yeah, there's all, all, all types of, of, of opportunities that all contribute to that one purpose, and that is the patient. About two minutes left, so let's. I just want to close it out on the. It's exciting that the the new hospital. Yeah. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be state of the art, over half a billion dollars. That's a huge, huge investment for this Northwest Florida community. Uh, when do when do the shovels hit the ground? Well, we expect to start in the uh, late spring or early summer of 2020. Okay. We expect a little less than a three-year construction timeline. We're in the design phase now. Uh, we've assembled our A team of architects and contractors and the like. Um, and so right now we're engaging the workforce to help design with input uh, this new facility. Um, and then we'll work through all the regulators and then we'll launch into turning dirt in the uh, in the summer of 2020 and then off we go. Okay, and so probably about 2023. 20, 2023 20, is when we expect to uh, be in a position to relocate the patients and the beds uh, and then have an opportunity to reimagine the current campus at Ian Marino. We think that can be much more impactful to that local community. Okay, so you'll, will you continue to own that and be involved with that? We, we have engaged a community advisory council okay. already. Okay. How, if we're going to have a significant amount of land that's going to be repurposed, how can it be really meaningful through to 32501 and 05 and the rest of the community? Mixed use, it can be a lot of different things. It's a huge opportunity, right. not just a new hospital, but we have a win-win scenario with right. what we can do with Ian Marino Street. Exciting times. Yes, it is. Thank you so much, Mark. My pleasure, Jeff. I wish you all the best. Thank you, sir. Mark Appreciate Faulkner. It. He is the president and the chief executive officer of the Baptist Healthcare System. And as we mentioned, a uh, big project on his desk here in the uh, coming years. A uh, brand new uh, hospital being built in Northwest Florida, over a half a billion dollar investment. So that's, uh, that'll move the needle for sure. By the way, you can see many more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also flying around YouTube, maybe even on Facebook. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself. I'll see you soon.